You're listening to the Mondays with Midja podcast. Founder and CEO of Legal Leadership, a company specialising in the leadership training and coaching of lawyers. Get set to jumpstart your week with a shot of mojo as Midja and her guests talk all things life, love and leadership. Hey, it's Monday and I'm Midja and welcome to the podcast all about life, love and leadership. I am very excited today because I have my very good friend and legal legend and just all round awesome person, Claire Eves from Shine Lawyers. Claire is the national practice leader and uh, I want to say a huge welcome to Claire. Welcome. Thank you, Midja. She's looking a bit nervous at me at the moment. Well, I'm not used to doing things without a screen. (laughs) This is quite exciting actually doing something without the screen for a while. I know. I know it's uh, and you know not scripted and um, we'll talk about lots of stuff and see what comes up. Sounds good. So Claire, um, context wise first. So just uh, talk to us a little bit about your role at Shine Lawyers, what you do, um, the team that you lead. Sort of put some context into our leadership discussions today. Yep. So I've uh, worked in the legal industry now for over twenty years been at Shine for 13 and for the last six of those I've ran a national medical law practice. Mm -hmm. So everyone in my team only practices in medical negligence. There's about 30 plus within the team nationally and it's just one of those really, really tough, complex areas of work but it's really interesting. So within the team generally I've got some really engaged people who love the legal side but also love the medicine side too Mm -hmm. so it really staggers those two disciplines yeah I was going to ask you like why why that specialty and what it appeals to you because I know you do a lot of um you have do a lot of work in the the disability space as well so yeah talk to me a little bit about the, the medicine and the law and the why behind what you do Well, originally, uh, as you know, Mitch, I'm from the UK. I'm from a very small working class little town. And I dated a lot of rugby players growing up. I bet you did, (laughs) Claire. I loved loved getting out. I loved the sports side of things. But a lot of them, in hindsight, probably wasn't very good rugby players because there was Mm -hmm. a lot of injuries. And I spent a lot of time with them all in rehabilitation, taking them to the physio appointments. And my first passion and love, I really wanted to be a physiotherapist. Okay. I I actually didn't know that about you. I love helping people kind of make gains and seeing what people can achieve, Mm -hmm. especially especially post-injury when you can create a whole new pathway, get on a new direction and make those gains, overcome some challenges. As it turns out, my brain was not as science-wired, so the study in law was a lot easier ended up doing my law degree and my first job was in personal injury law, Mm -hmm. quite reluctantly. I wanted to do commercial law and I kept getting offered roles in injury law. And I took my first job and I worked for this amazing guy and he did all the big ticket stuff. So big brain, spinal injury, sexual abuse, deaths, coronial inquiries. And I was absolutely hooked. Like all of my passions kind of came together and that was in I think 2001 and I haven't done anything else since that time. And coming to Australia, w- when did that happen and uh, and why over here and tell us a little bit about that. So 2008 I moved over here and at the time um, my other half who's now my husband He was working in hospitality and we were living above a nightclub and still living a very young, carefree life. And Mm -hmm. being a lawyer is not so much of a carefree existence. There's a lot of responsibility and you're never really off the clock. So the kind of two lifestyles wasn't really merging so well for me. Mm -hmm. So we did a whole year around the world trip and he had some family in Australia. We spent a bit of time here. And just loved it. So when we got home, we moved over here, got my first job at Shine and everything just organically just continued to grow from there, really. Mm -hmm. Love that. Love that. So so in your time, you would have had a lot of leaders. Uh, You're probably um, 
a lot of different experience in that space. Tell me about great leadership that you've experienced and some great leaders you've had in your career. What is it about them that makes them so memorable and, and, uh, and exceptional leaders? I've, I feel that I've been really fortunate to work for some really exceptional people mm. and the people that really stand out to me as being great leaders are always the ones who are really trying to build something bigger, to kind of grow something better than they have got. And especially working in the corporate environment, it can be very tempting to kind of get sucked into the quarter or sucked into the year and have a really kind of finite view of where you're going to the end of the year. And you need to be looking outwardly and so much bigger than that. And some of the leaders I've worked for have been really exceptional at that, Mm. looking at the big picture stuff. And not so much looking at the performance base, but looking at the how you get there is sometimes more important than getting there itself. So what are you building out as a product or a service and how are you doing that exceptionally well? And then the numbers really take care of themselves. Right, yeah, because of course, you know, in the legal profession and accountancy and, and other professional services when, you know, we're time recording and we're billing and there's a lot of measurables and six-minute units and and all of that, um, you can get bogged down in that and fail to see that, that bigger picture. So it sounds as though for you, if you've had a leader that's been able to to give you that more broader visionary kind of outlook, that's motivated you. That's made the difference. Absolutely. It's made a huge difference. And looking at it with that whole team culture piece as well, because it is such a performance-based industry, you get some people within that industry who are only motivated by their own individual performance, individual targets. Mm -hmm. And if it means helping somebody out, means they have to work harder to get their goals, they might not want to do that. Mm. So I've always have had leaders who've really promoted a whole a team-based environment and working together to kind of build something better is more important than hitting individual numbers. Mm. And certainly if you look at, um, you know, the research uh, around lawyers in particular and their characteristics, um you know, a lot of those characteristics are around autonomy, um, like low social uh, sociability and, and those sort of traits as well. Um, you know, competitive, wanting to get those results. And so stepping from those sort of characteristics to then now we want to lead a team where it's not then about your individual result, but around the team's results, around our results, around collaboration, um, that can be tough. It's a different skill set. It's a different view of of uh, how we work and how we add value. It's a very different skill set. And that's one mm. of the things that I really struggled with initially was just really appreciating how different individuals work, what motivates people, and making sure we have got a kind of diverse team that's a lot of collaboration, but really celebrating and appreciating those differences and not everybody works like me Mm. and that's that's good that's a good thing you know we need people who are high performance overachievers you need the slow and steady performers you need the people who just want to get the work done you need Mm. the people who want to innovate and have the big ideas so making up a team when you've got all of these diverse characters is super important But as a leader, you have to remember you have to manage all of them differently. And when you haven't managed people before, you come in with an approach of what do you need to do to motivate people? And you might have a bit of a one-size-fits-all approach Mm. until you realise that's not actually working very well. Which is usually your size. (laughs) It's usually what motivates you. Um, And then, yeah, if you've done the right thing and you haven't hired mini-me's, then you can't apply the same motivators to the people in your team. I, uh, I could never understand that. I, ha- I had trouble with some people that I was leading, particularly some lawyers. Why aren't they doing this? Why don't they see things my way? What's wrong with them? These are what, that's exactly what I would think to myself. So what's wrong with these people? Oh, it's actually me <laughs> and I need to adapt. Yeah, that's a big one. It is a big one. It is definitely a big one. And... And trying to tackle someone's 
state of mind as opposed to what they're doing because mm. trying to get somebody to work harder or work a little bit more like you or work differently is just never going to be effective. Mm. We need people to to buy into something, to want to be part of something, mm. to be motivated, to contribute to all of that. And that takes a really different approach. Do you think um, there's something particularly different around leading lawyers or leading that level of, of um, professionals? Do you see that, that there's some different challenges around that as opposed to maybe, you know, other leadership roles in, in other industries or other businesses? Well, there, there could be. I've only ever I've worked really in legal. But when you look at, I think, some of the things that, that we are faced with, everybody is just wearing so many different hats all the time, especially mm-hmm. when you're working in a listed corporation. So you've got to mm-hmm. be looking at your, your overall duties to the court and you've got a duty to your client, to your opponents, and then to your company and your shareholders and your team. And you're kind of spinning a lot of different plates. Mm-hmm. But I do find with lawyers, you do get some kind of common characteristics or common personality traits mm-hmm. that people have. And then just being mindful around some of those things as well. Mm. I always found it particularly hard to uh, lead people that were just, in the law at least, so much more experienced than I was. So, you know, I was, what, three or four years post-admission and leading people in the team that were 15 years post-admission. And I found that very awkward uh, as as a young lawyer to because these people had been admitted a long time. Like, they're a lot older than I am. I don't have that problem now, Claire. <laughs> now, I, I laugh now because wherever I go, I'm the oldest bloody person in the room. I'm like, how the hell did this happen all of a sudden? But it wasn't always the case. Um, and we might have some junior um, or, or some new leaders who are listening or people stepping up into their first sort of leadership role, their first gig. Maybe they're having some imposter syndrome. Maybe they don't have the confidence. Some tips for them around, you know, um, stepping up into leadership and what might help, what you wish you kind of knew as a as a new leader? Oh, there's so many things I <laughs> wish I'd have known back then that I do now. Mm-hmm. Um, so many helpful tips. I think some really good things to do is to, to get a good mentor. Mm-hmm. Um, having a mentor within this type of profession particularly if you're doing management roles and you're trying to straddle the the technical side the business the leadership and you might be running a business and you're an entrepreneur or within a company and you're an intrapreneur there's all of these new skills that you're expected to know and develop and I think having that confidence like you said is the biggest thing because Mm -hmm. you're in that role for a reason and you've got something really special to contribute for that so really tapping into what are those skills and qualities? Mm-hmm. And I think the interesting thing for me in leadership, the, the longer I've done it and the better that I get at it, is not always about developing new skills. It's about stripping away some of the things that you've built up mm-hmm. that are impacting you on doing that. Mm-hmm. So it is getting rid of some of that imposter syndrome, stripping that armour off and being a bit more vulnerable. Mm-hmm. You don't have to always be the pillar of perfection, in control, and you need to make tough decisions and you need to be capable and confident, but you also need to be vulnerable and you need to let people know this is a really tough thing we're going through. Let's talk about this. And I'm having difficulty with this. How are you feeling about this? So there's all these other things that you've, you've got to tap into. And I think part of that is just stripping away some of the things that we build up over time, not even necessarily learning new things, and then just being your authentic self. Mm -hmm. Quite often people aren't because they've built all these things up they think they need to be or need to say or have a certain perception or a certain way of doing things. So stripping it back sometimes can be really powerful as well and just being yourself, following Mm. your instincts on things, really important. Yeah, I love that. And I was talking to a partner the other day and she had like a personal mission uh, for herself in partnership uh, big in big law that she wanted to show people that there was a, a different way of being a partner and that there are different styles and different approaches to leadership and partnership within the law. 
and because so many of the partners, same, same. They're all kind of the same sort of mould, you know, yeah. same sort of model. And she's like, I want to give people a different way of leading. And I loved that as just a personal kind of mission statement for herself, yes. stepping into a role. Um, and, of course, we can think the exact opposite. You know, we can think that we need to, you know, put the walls up and keep the armour on and behave in a certain way. But, of course, that doesn't make us very relatable as leaders. It, it doesn't create a safe environment as a leader mm. where your team can just be open and honest and you can all collaborate and talk about things. If there's an element of mistrust or perceived judgement in the room, you're just not you're just not going to have that safe zone mm -hmm. in your teams. Absolutely. So what do you think... What do you think a new people stepping, like our, our young professionals stepping up into the law or other or other industries, what are they looking for, in, like in a workplace, in a team, in a leader? What do you think they want? Because you, you would be hiring people, you would be um, talking to this next generation of, of team members and maybe you're hearing different things but some of the things you're hearing that they want from a job, from from a team? I think what people are looking for now is to, to be in an organisation that is doing something a little bit bigger, where they can work within a team for someone who is helping pull them up and teach them different skills. So long gone are the days where people just come in as a lawyer and develop your legal skills. Mm -hmm. People are realising it's all about working smarter not harder it's about relationships and it's about opportunities it's not just about coming in and doing the work mm. so I think that's really what people are looking for and the next generation seem to be very much looking for an element of flexibility mm. so we, we're starting to lose this traditional nine to five model people want to know what do you work from home policies um, yes. What are your, your, you know, your policies around this? What's expected of me around business development and social media? That That's not anything I would have ever thought of being a lawyer. It's you come in, you can do, if you do the work, you're a good technical lawyer. That ticked a lot of the boxes, but things are changing. Mm -hmm. And the new generation seem to be really savvy and really across that, that they know it is a more flexible model. It's a service-based industry, so... There's all these other things to look at around client care as well. It's not just being a, a technical whiz anymore. There's all these other things. And I think that's what's really fascinated me about interviews, the questions you get around those types of things and support for learning and development um, and particularly the flexibility piece is just mm. something that we're not used to. What do you think are some of the challenges around that that, that leaders or, and law firms kind of face now? What are some of the tension points around what people want and from a, a business model uh, management point of view? Like, are there some tension there, do you see? Well, I think law firms are still really traditional. Mm. Or some law firms are still very traditional. And we, what we've, we've tried to do within our team is to, to, to look at it as a service-based industry. So people are actually judging us by the standard of other service providers, not other lawyers. Yes. They don't want an eight-page letter with legal jargon. They want a, a little visual map or something digitally that shows where their claim is going. Mm -hmm. Like, we need to be a lot more innovative. So I think some of the challenges are that we've got a new generation of people who are really savvy around a lot of those things, but we've still got some really traditional law firms with traditional resources and bricks and mortar so people are going yes. well we've got this office that fits 40 people why, why would we want you working from home you know we've got an office that's half full we need everybody in the office and I think having that mentality still around you need to be in as a junior learning from all your co-workers we can't have you at home because you're not going to be performing as well or learning as much and I think there is a role, role there for, for some kind of hybrid out of yes. this. And COVID has been, I think, one of the biggest things that have kind of forced leaders to look at how are we working? And if you're an organisation or a team that adapt to change really well and are quite progressive, then you've, you've absorbed a lot of these things well. But the ones that haven't are still going, we just need it to get back to normal. 
And there is not going to be a normal. We're in the new normal now. Yes. Yeah, and that 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 hybrid model and how that kind of works and um yeah, talking to people, you know, I've spoken to some grads out of uh, Bond University here on the Gold Coast and you know, some of them want to be in the office um, because they haven't met their legal team or their leader or and they're worried about working from home because they don't really know what they're doing and they can't sort of learn by overhearing or just, you know, when you just like roll your chair back and go, excuse me, how do I do this? Like, do you know how to do this? Like, it, that's hard when you're at home and you've never met people. Um, so I, I certainly, I, I like that model and I don't know about you, Claire, but I learned a lot just from sharing a desk with a partner and just listening to every conversation they had and, and going out with them to see clients. Um, but we also, you know, there's that, that, that work from home and that flexibility piece and that hybrid model that we want to encourage as well for, for wellness and balance and work-life integration and all that kind of stuff. So we... Oh, so many we gotta, moving parts. We've got to bring the two together. Yeah. And, and there is a place for that, I think, that could work very successfully. But you don't want to lose that aspect of that mentorship. And the team building. Yes, and the team building. And, you know, just meet people. I mean, you talk to most people and they m- met their partners often at work and they've met their friends. You know, like if I look at my group of friends, most of them I have met through work. You know, close relationships like you and I, um, that we met like physically working together and sharing space and doing that. So, you know, we don't want to take that away. Um, and the big thing we do in our team is celebrate the wins. Yeah. And that's really hard to do when you're virtual. We've had some in whoop, COVID. Whoop. <laughs> it's like everyone open your, you know, champagne now and cheers the Zoom screen. Yeah. I mean, it's it's been fine. But there's 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 something about actually cheering and clinking glasses and and doing that that's important and uh, and just the conversations that happen yeah that don't that tend not to happen when it's a formal sort of Zoom or Teams meeting yeah really different different vibe hmm some stuff to think about yeah love that love all of that so. Um, in, on the podcast, we have a a segment called Leader Shit. This is like confession time. So it is the shittiest thing. This is when I need a couch and an hour session. <laughs> Absolutely. A shot of something. Um, so just, Claire, something that, you know, a mistake you made, something that – often we have moments that just keep haunting us. I have moments in my career in business where – yeah, I still think about them. I yes. still think about those kind of mistakes. You got something that you're willing to share with our listeners? I think probably early on in my leadership journey, probably the first six to 12 months was the most challenging part mm-hmm. for me. Really challenging. Coming into a team, running a team, when I, I just didn't have that experience. Not everyone within the team was probably a great cultural fit to the team or the organization the model just kind of wasn't working and just not having those the skills and and the mindset like we've talked about Mm -hmm. you know I kind of had that view that if you go in and you do everything and you show everyone the, the way to do it and you work harder and you tell other people to work harder it's just going to work and it just didn't and people yeah. became more resentful and the gap just got bigger and bigger and then after kind of a year in, I just thought, is this for me? Because I'm a, I am know I'm a good lawyer. I love helping people. I love helping people achieve gains and go further and be the best version of themselves. And I love to be the best version of myself. But I'm not very good at this. It's just not working. Like, why isn't it working? And I think at that point then, just taking a huge, huge step back and thinking, well, there's so much that is kind of broken about this. How am I going to start to implement some things to fix this and to write this? And for me, the key there was was getting a good mentor. Mm-hmm. And half the time I'd speak for half an hour and I'd figure it out myself. Yeah. But just having that space to actually work through the process. 
and look at, well, what, what is working and what is not working and what have you got to do about that? And sometimes it's making those tough decisions and you might not be so popular with certain people. Mm. And uh, underneath, you want everyone to like you. You think that's what everyone needs in a, in a leader. But then you start to realise you're in a really different place to that. You know, mm. you've got to create a great and a fun and dynamic environment. And you've got to be someone nice to work with. You've got to be someone worth following. But you're not friends. Yes. It's a different thing. So mm -hmm. it was a huge learning curve for me. But one where, you know, you could you could give up very easily if you don't persist mm -hmm. because there is a lot of reflection you need to do when you're helicoptered in from a technical role to then a leadership role especially when there's a lot of other complexities in an organization there's a lot of reflection you need to do before you can even start to process how do you make this a better place to be for everybody else and giving yourself the space getting off the wheel long enough to give yourself that gift of you know self-reflection and and self-awareness and asking yourself the questions and absolutely and talk to me I don't, we haven't mentioned this but just around how to how to keep your mojo happening you know like I know for you you've, you know, you've got two kids and you're married and you do a lot of work in the community and obviously you've got a national role in a huge law firm and a lot of different hats and so, and we know from the stats in the legal profession that um, mental illness and, and people are feeling pretty wiped out. People are feeling like they've got nothing left to give. Um, and we are losing people from the profession. And let's face it now, your professional career is a long one. I mean, most people are going to be into maybe their early 70s, right, working. Um how do we keep our mojo and our passion and our purpose? And I don't know if that's exciting or depressing. Come on, Claire, Claire, I'll be by your side. We'll be just fine. We'll be just fine. So, do, and and some of this, like, um, uh, just, uh, I suppose, reinventing yourself in your career a little bit as well. Because I know sometimes we talk about that around how to how to keep it fresh. Absolutely, and you've got to be able to kind of pivot and adapt yeah. and move in different directions. Mm -hmm. And you're figuring out all the time what's important or where you want to spend your time. I'm a very big advocate of the fact that you, you do get to choose the life that you want. Yes. I'm a huge advocate of that. And that's not always about title or money or work. It's about where you spend your time, who you spend your time with. And as you said, I do a lot in the community. I do a lot with different charities and organisations. And I always have a bit of a vision of where I want to be and how that is all integrating with work and how sometimes it kind of integrates with family. Mm -hmm. So even though I do a lot, I'm, I'm quite deliberate now about where I spend my time and it's stuff that makes me happy, stuff that I get a lot of value from and I, I get a lot of value out of. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the important thing because historically I haven't always been that way. I've I'm, I'm mm -hmm. got a really high work ethic, crazy yes. high work ethic. And I think at some point in my career I confused movement with progress mm. and you can work really hard and not really get anywhere. You're just on a hamster wheel or you can be investing in things outside of work. It's not really fulfilling you or taking you anywhere. So if you don't have a vision or a goal to supplement that kind of structure, then you're just working really hard and you're not really saying getting yes anywhere. to everything and yeah. everyone. Yeah. yeah, love that advice. So I know you do um, some with like the, the surf life saving here, but your kids are involved in that as well. And so it's a family time, but it's also a community time. So is that what you know, like that, that connection piece for you around everything that you do has some sort of connection and, and purpose and it's conscious, it's deliberate. It's really you spend conscious. Your time. Yeah, mm. and and through the nippers, we've got um, amazing people who run the Albatross Nippers, which is for high needs children, mm -hmm. and that's once a month. And just even uh, kind of explaining to my kids around how we need to do a little bit more because not everyone has the same opportunities mm. we do. 
not everyone has the same access or support. People can be quite isolated. Mm -hmm. So we've got to be kind and we've got to get people involved and we've got to help and we've got to contribute. Mm. And we don't single people out and treat them differently or specially, but we need to be conscious of that and we, we need to make changes and adaptations and be a little bit more inclusive and a, a little bit more open. So things like that are hugely important for me because it spills so much into my work and yeah, some of the work that I do <laughs> with charities. And that's where it's going to be. It's just educating this next generation of people. Mm. And whilst you think every generation is going to be more open and inclusive and diverse, you do worry a little bit with technology and social media that <clears throat> it's kind of got this elitist culture about it and everybody has got this perception of perfection with it so mm -hmm. getting down into the real world and looking at some of the things that are going on on the ground and where we need to spend our time and focus is really important for me yeah absolutely I love that that you can uh you can wear a number of different hats for that you know that investment of time and, and energy for you so I think that's a great tip to give people is to really think about, um, you know, what's aligned with their personal values, what might align with other roles that they have in their life and to – that they own that choice. Yeah. Um, and you can have a lot of fun with it. Mm -hmm. So in, instead of, you know, with work, a huge part of what I do is look at that outward facing, looking outward, looking at new work opportunities – building relationships, tra generating new business. So instead of going for a lunch, have a look what is on in terms of charity functions. Book a table at a gala or at an event and take some people with you. And then you get to have a great fun day out. You get to combine it with building relationships or nurturing old relationships. So there's a lot you can do if you don't have. We, we've all got a limited amount of time. Of so course. you can be very smart with how you spend that to make it a bit of a win-win. Yeah, look, it's got to be fun. It's got to be fun. It's got to be some play involved in it. And, um, yeah, what's one of my sayings I'm, I'm at the moment? It's like work hard, play harder. Absolutely. So it's it, it's got to be enjoyable. Not that every day is rainbows and butterflies, but that underlying purpose and fulfilment piece, you've got that, and uh, and you're willing to do the work for it. Yeah. Because... Uh, yeah, for a lot of our people, um, you know, in our teams and so forth, we want them there for the long term. Like we, we want this to be sustainable. We want them to be able to practice law or to run their business or, you know, and even parenting that. It, everything, it's a long gig. It is a long gig. It's, it's not little, it's not a sprint here. It's an absolute marathon for most of us in these roles and – we to look after ourselves. Oh, we do. And to look after others because the mm. biggest thing that I've learned as a leader is to recruit well, is yes. my number one thing now. Yep. Recruit well and look after the team you have got. Mm. Look after them well. Find out what they want, what motivates them, what they need. Be flexible. Be open. Help them achieve whatever they need to achieve from a, a work or a personal perspective or a development perspective and be supportive because it comes back to you absolutely tenfold. Mm -hmm. And coming back to that piece of we all get to choose how we spend our time. People get to choose whether or not they want to work in my team and, and work at Shine. Yes. You've got to make it a great place to be. And it's you've got to have incentives and benefits. And it's not always financial. It, it is around flexibility or helping people develop the presentation skills or the business skills or build a network or whatever that person is interested in doing. Mm. So it is about just making it a, a nice place to be and really investing that time back with your team. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, anything else on leadership, Claire, before we kind of take a bit of a, a turn to love? Anything else? Well, I don't know how much helpful I'm going to be in, in the love avenue, but you can... I will do my best, Midge. I'll Come on, best. Claire. You know I'm on a mission to find big love. Of course, Claire, Claire hears about this weekly, so it's she's probably sick of me talking about it. Dating advice, Claire. Love advice. Who can you see for me? 
Oh, somebody who hasn't dated for 22 years, my advice is going to be a little bit rusty. But I think, Midge, if I if I was newly on the market, I would yeah. probably approach it like everything else I do, with a high level of structure, You'd organization. Have a spreadsheet. I, I would I would be very, very organized with how I'm approaching it. Mm. And if you think about like what I've I've done with my kind of intake model at Shine, medical negligence is a really, really speculative work type. And there's a lot of clients who we can't help or support because there just hasn't been that fault component or restricted by the legislation. So when you think about it in terms of the, the model, you could maybe apply this a little bit to dating oh, life. I love this. We look at, well, what kind of client do we want to attract? What's our <sighs> ideal client base? So we do a bit of work around that. Sure, we get like an avatar of our, our perfect yeah, date. our perfect date. And okay. it will have kind of age, characteristics, everything else around it. Mm -hmm. Then we'll look at what are we putting out there <laughs> to attract our perfect client, perfect yes. date. Yes. That would be the next thing. And then with medical law, because like from it is... from a marketing is, PR kind of perspective? Yeah. Okay. From a socials perspective, mm -hmm. what are we putting out there mm -hmm. to hook... It's maybe what I'm doing wrong. This ideal client base okay. or ideal person base. And then with medical law, because it's speculative, it is a volume game. It's about numbers, numbers. and quality. Claire... I have to, you know this, if it's a numbers game, if it's a bloody numbers game, I should be winning. I should be winning. But yes, I think maybe it's the, um, it's that, it's that first step. It's positioning the business. Yeah. Positioning the business. Maybe some more work on that. Well, positioning, because if you're getting the numbers, but you're not getting the quality, yes. then we're putting something out there that's okay. just not getting the benefit. That's, that's, um. That's making sense. I think that definitely deserves a lunch and a bottle of wine to really go deep on that, Claire. I think it does. After the podcast. And when we get our ideal client in, we then look at how we best service that client. But uh, I'm not yes. sure that that would be appropriate to try and build into this model. But we can see. See Abs where lunch takes us. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love that advice. Because I'm, I'm thinking about collating all this advice into some book at some stage later on. Well, so I think you need to. I think you need to. Like, there's just so many top dating tips that you could put out there from your experience. But I feel, you know what, Claire, I can't write this book until I find the big love. I feel like there's no ending to the book. You know, like I've got to go you know, through the, the journey. Story. Yes, because I've got to then have the success story. I've got to go through all the crap and lessons learned and then ta-da, she found big love. So I'm just I'm waiting. following her own formula. That's right. So, yeah, we'll work on that. That's another project. We'll put that in the in the other project box. Like um, Claire, it's been an absolute delight to have you on the podcast. I love you very much. You know that. Oh, I love you too. And thank you for having me in person, away from Teams and Zoom. And yeah. To let me loose for the afternoon. It's in the wonderful. studio right now. Of course, we have our little um, woo-woo from the universe, a message the universe is giving you for the week ahead. Um, I have trust your crazy ideas cards or I have dream. Which one do we want, Claire? Well, given if you haven't got a dream, you've got nothing. Let's yeah, go with dream. Let's go with dream. Okay. You get to pick one out, Claire. Whatever one feels like, you know, it's calling to you. Okay. There's okay. one. Open that up and tell us the message for you this week. Hopefully it's a goodie, fingers crossed. Go as far as you can see. When you get there, you'll be able to see further. <gasps> what do you think about that, Claire? I'm not thinking big enough, Midge. Yeah. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Look, you, th you, you can only see this far. That's where I thought the end was, but you've, it's not. You've got to see more. further. There's, yeah, more. there's more. Love that. Claire, how can people... Connect with you, get in touch with you. Tell me all of that stuff. I'm pretty easy to find via Shine or on LinkedIn. So if anybody needs medical law services or would just like me to come and do some CPD stuff, um, they can find me through LinkedIn. 
Perfect. Thank you so much, Claire. Uh, Thank you, everyone, for listening today. I hope you have a fantastic week ahead. Go out there, share your magic. I'm Midja, and thank God it's Monday. We trust you enjoyed this episode of the Mondays with Midja podcast. Host Midja Fisher is a leadership expert, keynote speaker, coach, and facilitator. To find out more about Midja, visit midja.com.au or follow her on Instagram, Midja Fisher. And make sure you subscribe, share, and leave a review. 